woman, her name's Mayor Duren, catches, uh, catches somebody's eye in the street. She goes back home, picks up a flower, falls asleep in her armchair. And then something strange begins to happen. An unusual figure with a glass face is walking around her home. Uh, she meets a doppelganger. It's a knife. She tries to stab herself. The walls twist and fall apart. I think this tells us a lot about Trump's America. <laughs> um, from WBZ Chicago, this is this cinematographer's life. <laughs> I'm Peter Bradshaw. <laughs> I give up, I give up, I give up. Um, this week we're doing something slightly different, um, which is we're doing a little mini episode of MoobTube. Yes, um, a mini Moob. A, a mini Moob, yeah, small Moobs, um, bee stings. Um, and the purpose behind it, <laughs> the purpose behind it, I is just because, realized that. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, we're we, basically we're both quite knackered, I think, and we've been very just up against it for the last kind of um, how long? Eight months. Uh, what the, we've done this pod? Yeah, I guess it is eight months. Yeah, um, we've not given ourselves any any breaks have we and we were unable no. to to kind of put a foot on the on the pedal on the brake and say that's not because we worried we'll lose our momentum if we do that so instead we're coming at you with a condensed mini light episode move tube light um yeah and i mean that's i mean i'll say the name of the film you will definitely be aware of it it's a film me and ralph saw uh uh experimenter mixtape at the bfi uh blurp yeah, the BFI in a um, curated by William year. Fowler. Yeah, an exceptional. Uh, okay. It was a weird night. It was a very weird night. Um, it was a weird night, actually. Yeah, some weird films that we watched there. I think um, that was like the one of the last cinema things before lockdown that we did. Yeah, I think it might have even been the last. Um, which is kind of fitting that we've come back to it now. Um, but yeah, we the film that was well, we actually missed the first half of it because um, we were a bit late. But um, the film we're looking at today is Mayor Duren's and Alexander Hamid's, but whatever, uh, Meshes of the Afternoon from 1943. Take it away. So this is a film, it's set in LA, I believe. Definitely, yeah. This is an experimental film from 1943. It has very dreamlike vibes to it. Mm. Made by a husband and wife, which is interesting. I guess I guess I have a weird beef with husband and wife projects. I don't know if that's Go just because I'm, I'm most Cause often, quite often single. But um, mm. Straub I, I find to be totally shit. Um, <laughs> come at me. Come at you me, listeners. Help, you couldn't help dig the knife in, could you? <laughs> not all. Or not all. Um, it's a bit Tolstoy, isn't it? You know, all happy families are the same, but all unhappy marriages are unique in their own ways. Um, exactly. But I, don't know, um, I don't know how much to attach the significance to this that it is husband and wife. I thought Alexander Hamid was just kind of the cinematographer sort of yeah i think maya is kind of the top in this in this yeah, situation top dog. yeah um yeah so there's a there's a um i don't the wikipedia is open but uh it's actually not helping me at all because it's full of a lot of banalities about symbolism so mm. i'm gonna go off my post-it note um i've got a few questions and a few thoughts relating to this film we're not going to talk in the way we usually talk about films in such depth as we usually do because it's a short film and it would be a bit absurd to talk for 40 minutes about a film that's only 14 minutes so mm. i'll just say this um one of the themes we've talked about one of the things that i guess i bring up sometimes when we talk about a film that's a little bit experimental a bit non-linear is what is this film's relationship to dreams and mm. you know i believe that cinema is a is a medium that ha that is closely related to dreams mm. and very often you see a film where someone falls asleep yeah. and a dream happens this happens in meshes in the afternoon it happens in lots of films yeah you might get a little fade or a kind of uh, a wobble effect you know the kind exactly. of the, the cartoony cliches of how you you represent that transition from the waking state to the dream state yeah also dreams are like very much dreams themselves are very much powered by fear and desire mm. And in this film as well, there's like a kind of sensual, erotic drive of desiring, of desiring someone, and, and or like desiring, or desiring a connection to these surfaces like water and wind and stuff and light mm. sunlight. 
and then there's also the fear of death or the fear of self-dissolution i think self yeah the, the yeah. being stabbed by one's doppelganger well not not even this literally stabbed but i think kind of frag the, the sense of self fragmenting um mm. under the pressures of like the dream state maybe or just life because you know like you said it uses surfaces the mirror is such a gear again i don't want to kind of like labor the point too much about symbols because symbols are symbols they they represent things but i think they're they're quite how um Mandarin kind of resisted like freudian readings of this film she's like no 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 this is about um dreams really and the ability of cinema to represent dreams um and i think we can kind of take these these symbols as quite um significant but kind of hollow i don't think but that's really... i think maybe my beef with this film um, Go on. well i don't think she can say that really go on death Death of the death of the cinematographer is what <laughs> the quote here. <laughs> Darren adamantly objected to her film undergoing analysis for its symbolism. For her, the objects in the film were just that objects, mm. whose value and meaning is defined and confirmed by their actual function in the context of the film as a whole. Darren wanted her audiences to appreciate art for its conscious value, and spent a lot of her later career de- delivering lectures and writing essays on her film theory. So, um, I. I think it is quite a symbolic film. I think there are certain films made around the period of surrealism. En Chien Andalou by Louis Bunuel and Salvador Dali. Um, Classic, many, of Co- yeah. many of Cocteau's early works, Blood of a Poet. And these things are remarkable and they do deviate greatly from mainstream cinema of the time. Mm. And it's very exciting to watch these films, but I don't think they... I do think there's a certain clunkiness I feel when I see surrealist films from that era in that they attempt they have moments of transcendence where they are not symbolic where they're kind of at their best where the images just jut up against each other poetically rather than um mm. rather than attempting to create some kind of symbolism but i think when you're working with something so explicitly dreamlike it's very hard to avoid symbolism i think a lot of the stuff it is quite symbolic yeah, it to ha- have a doppelganger to, killing you. Like that, that's symbolic. That's yeah. You're having a doppelganger, symbolic. having a figure, your husband, his face being a mirror. You know, upon be, upon stabbing your husband, his face turning into a smashed mirror. Um, yeah, but then I think this film to had to be, read, to be made for Mulholland Drive to be made. You know, because yeah, that, this like, is. Li- I was thinking this when I was watching it. It, it, it is strangely like a kind of tr- repressed memory laying behind Mulholland Drive because. Not just like the LA Hollywood setting, um, although I couldn't avoid that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely the, part the, of it. The kind of um, the kind of uh, irregular, asymmetric nature of these, um, yeah, like you said, these quite jutting um, symbols owes a lot to that kind of like Lynchian weird. Um, but I think there's also it's this is like you said, Cocteau. You mentioned that like, the Orphic trilogy with Cocteau. This has got a very like there's these forking paths of avant-garde film in the early 20th century, right? And obviously you've got the surrealists, and this is obviously a later in a later kind of uh, godchild to those films. Um, but it's very different from the avant-garde experiments of like uh, Vertov or these kind of socially minded political, you know, where the, where avant-garde techniques were used for political ends. Here, mm. this is solidly a very bohemian film um, in a way that uh, uh, Blood of a Poet and Cocteau was. You know, this kind of uh, delirious. Uh, kind of reveling in the meaninglessness of the symbols but they're also rep- you know representing and you know kind of digging back into repressed subconscious almost Jungian archetypes um, so it, uh, you're right like in a way for Darren to say you can't analyze this film that's like the patient on Freud's couch saying you can't analyze me yes um, exactly they're just dreams like because they do reveal certain preoccupations she made this film in a particular way it didn't have to be a double a doppelganger this dream that anything could have happened in this dream she chose to represent a kind of fractured self and uh th- like you said this kind of desiring violence right that's a very conscious conscious subconscious thing that she chose that particular plot um i'm gonna i'm gonna go a bit further and i'm gonna say go that silent cinema has a certain anxiety to it mm. i think a lot of not all probably but and the comedy films because they're drawing on an earlier vaudeville tradition, I think, resist it. But a lot of pre-1960, I guess, um, films which are experimental um, and silent, they're a bit like 
paintings that are trying to be photographed before photography has been invented because that you can't yeah yeah because the te- they're limited by technology in a way that i don't think is like in the 1960s then you get like in the 70s and you get more avant-garde films which are working playfully within those limitations but i think there's like an eisenstein there's a sort of juddery eisensteininess like all the shots of the keys and stuff no it's quite anxious i don't know yeah. i think it, i mean i like it it's a good film it's really engaging and yeah. beautiful and it's not very long but i think it doesn't bewitch me in a way that i think some of the individual images really do bewitch mm. me but as a sequence it kind of feels a bit bait i kind of yeah i kind of found that with other of her films like because late, later in her career she turned to making ethnographic film um, oh yeah she went to haiti didn't she yeah meditations on violence in haiti but mm. you know she made at land which is really similar you know she's clothed really similarly and there's a lot of these anxieties about her crawling over a dinner table at a dinner party um running across a beach like she's got these preoccupations that she's playing with i i know what you're saying about the anxiety of it or anxiety of silent film generally because with i mean she anxi- and Andalou is full of anxiety right they're kind of intentionally i think because a lot of it's feeding into um, the is is actually going back to an earlier kind of Trump style cinema, you know, cinema is trickery and cinema that's being used to kind of mm. shock and surprise you intentionally. Like it's the kind of visual, the resting visual nature of things like uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu um, in Robert Viner films, Fritz Lang films, Murnau films, like especially German, um, very gothic, very expressionist cinema, um, and it, it owes a lot of like debt to those films, I think. And they are they are kind of anxiety inducing because um, a lot of them are about that kind of tortured post war state of mind, right? Post World War One, I should say here. Even though yeah. Duren is making this in forty three, it's definitely the inheritor of those those traditions and those films. You know, in Germany, it was post World War One. Uh, anxiety um, in Weimar Germany you know economic collapse the rise of fascism so on like they've all got in there and they're quite anxious to watch I think it's also to do with like as it were the frame rate of these films Mm, and the fact that you're waiting yeah and you're waiting for intertitles to like you know it's they've got this like uh, kind of weird skeleton to them so you're always waiting for yeah there's not a smoothness to the way they happen i think that's how it feels and this is kind of the same you're waiting for a significance or a meaning that's always delayed and never quite reveals itself but it is beautiful it's the kind of film that like if i'd seen this when i was 16 this would have been really influential for me but with the meaning i mean i think that that's i think that struggle for meaning is part of the problem i think if it was made in a different way it wouldn't beg for meaning in the way that it does it's all like that's what I mean. It's all very well. Like there are films that are made, like Tarkovsky's Mirror. Like people still do it because people are stupid. But like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, like a, 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 a well-made poetic film doesn't <laughs> beg for meaning. Like a, you know, Manhattan Drive. Like you yeah. can really just enjoy that on a, on a on a on a surface level makes it sound shallow. But in, what I mean is like on a like you know, the woman gets out of the car. You know, like it is. That, yeah. that is that is. What's what she says? You know, the objects are just that objects. The things are just what they are. But the problem is, it's when you use those very big dreamlike archetypes, it is like it's unavoidable. I think. Yeah, I guess so. We're kind of going, but with Tarkovsky, he didn't necessarily use archetypes in the same way. I guess that's why his dream sequences are less irritating they are actually generally surprising very satical as well you know symmetry mm. of splen- symmetry of splendor like it's a non-archetypal um representation of dream states and sleeping i think which is yeah really because i think the, the, the it's because it's about the sequence because what you see on screen um there isn't this eisensteinian montage cinema principle or this kind of hitchcockian Hitchcock and Eisenstein have this principle of cinema which is about driving an emotion home through objects, through cuts, through, you know, sequence. Whereas what the surrealists have at their disposal, in my view, um, what people on the avant-garde have in general, is the ability for people to find meaning in the gaps Mm. between things. And I think stylistically this film does a bit of both it does a sort of does the kind of eisensteinian bludgeoning the the feeling home with the tools of the conventional tools of cinema plus the mm. general absurdity of of these yeah. scenes 
it just feels that they the the driving momentum behind them is just why not here yeah whereas it feels like you know la jete chris market feels like <coughs> a, a place where a dreamlike state was created sustained across the entirety of the film mm. um using ju- you know jugular angular still cuts um to a much greater ends and actually i felt i felt like chris marker i felt there was like a similarity in aesthetic between this and uh la jete particularly when she wears those like boggly eyeglasses with the knife and we see her in this low shot right um low angle shot um and i feel like there's a kind of like yeah there's a markerian vibe between them but what marker does is he kind of creates a really enthralling narrative momentum to the film whereas this is mm. kind of oh like what if what if um which is kind of cool like i do like it it's really it's a really exciting bit of 14 minutes of film but whether it's like i think about it um I, after i stop watching it i don't know that's interesting what you say about marker and the the narrative drive it's it's almost like if you if you put the if they put the narrative there that sort of frees you up <laughs> visually to just engage in like the look ti- in time yeah. and 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 time and and the unfolding of time and you know pure cinema mm. basically the, sculpt- the sculpting of time yeah this Tarkovsky exactly but if you, time yeah but if you don't have a narrative structure then the narrative structure becomes the the images right and i think mm. that's what happens in a lot of experimental films and that's maybe why i'm like sort of partly opposed to experimental cinema in some ways that's because I think the, because the narrative structure is mm. um, is just the unfolding of of particular images, and so inevitably, yeah. they're, they're, I think they beg for meaning. Yeah, because you don't, they don't need meaning if you have a narrative. Like Bresson doesn't. Bresson just has like, oh, someone gets escapes from a prison, right? So nothing has to mean anything no. because it's just someone. But getting that's out of enough. Prison. That's enough with you know because you can allude to the with 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 that particular film. You can allude to the entire history of world war Two and this the 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 fight of the underground in the resistance in in france mm. right it, it doesn't need to pull on it but it's there whereas here it's like okay yeah it feels like the it's shorn of context beg- shorn of context yeah and it's like it, it feels like you said begging for meaning perhaps i feel like i i, I kind of been talking to you and become a lot more critical about it. i'm not critical i think i think it's just interesting stuff about you know experimental cinema like it doesn't need to be this is a symbol this is a symbol and it also can completely have no context as well stan it's why stan brackage is really interesting um but there he's not asking for it it's, he's producing a kind of visual hypnos- hypnosis almost um i think it's very different this is, this is kind of trying to have both it's trying to have this implied emotional resonance which kind of i guess isn't there even though it's really interesting to watch it's very clever yeah, there's just scenes with the keys just reminded me of like the steps, the Odessa steps in Eisenstein. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, like, it's like, also a key is obviously symbolic. Like you have a key, you open a door, you swallow a key. Like that stuff is you can't, you know. Someone had to do it though. This, I mean, someone had to. Oh, singer. totally, totally. Yeah, she had to do this film because this, this, this now means that you can't do this. If you're at film school, you can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's been interesting done. as well if because someone... Lynch, Lynch does use really. Uh, no, I was thinking about. I said the thing about the key, and then I was like, well, Mulholland Drive but, has this thing with the key opening. The but box. they're inscrutable, though, aren't they? It's like here's a kettle <laughs> with David Bowie's voice in it. You know, this, the, <laughs> it, 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 his his films like play in a very fun way, whereas this is a very serious film. It's a very serious repressed symbols aren't they like that's true whereas Bla- uh, blake what am i talking about um lynch is very playful with his symbology mm. like it's it's he's he's almost he's having a lot of fun with creating these these kind of bizarre inscrutable symbols and dream logics um and their kind of inscrutability is what makes them interesting um it creates the enigma whereas these are kind of asking to be enigmatic but like you said they're quite obvious a knife a key a flower um a mirror it's yeah it's a bit cluedo it's quite interesting the lead piping it's quite it's quite interesting <laughs> that she went on to do ethnography like did mm. she just think oh shit i should stop filming my white body or did she just have like a sort of no she didn't have or? a work i don't think she had a work really. i think it, she was interested in its liminal states and i think uh-huh. the dream and she was interested in uh you know um 
uh, voodoo, supposedly. So, you know, violence, voodoo, uh, transcendental states, liminal states. Um, and I think these dreams kind of preceded that. She did, she, she walked with these thoughts so she could run with the ethnography, I think. Um, and kind of explore those things in a real, a grounded way. Um, the, I read, I read the Wikipedia article as well. And it said she got, she, she. I hate when people do this. She got criticised for abandoning her avant-garde experiments. I don't know what that means. No, it feels, it really feels like she sort of got what she needed out of that. And I yeah. was watching, um, I mean, I was watching a bit of Witch's Cradle, which is like a much more explicitly occult film, and I think a better film probably. Like the stuff with the strings in that was really focused and really beautiful like when this mm. guy is being sort of like he's doing that cat which is that cat's cradle thing with a string and his fingers and then he sort of then his whole body is being like strung up slowly by, mm. by like an uh, autonomous piece of string like so i mean i that gave me a bit of context for like they they are like these films are basically like kind of bad dreams but i just <laughs> I don't know. Meshes the afternoon. I think also we saw it in a cinema and it was really stunning. There's like something visually like it's really puffy and full of high contrast and grainy and mm. sounds have this kind of real thud to them. The music, it's, it's, Ito's, Ito's score with this kind of plucked mm. weirdness to it really works well on that scale, I think. Um, no, it's delicious in some ways. Yeah. I think I was being a bit critical. Basically, I was sort of. It's uh, some of the thoughts for our. This leads us into an outro. Some of the some of the thoughts I was kind of b- playing with in that conversation are thoughts I've been provoked into by um, watching the work of Manny Cow. Um, mm. Nice segue, though. Yeah. <laughs> so next week we will be having a uh, a special. Full um, frontal special. Um, a full frontal special on the work of the Indian director. Manny Cowell. Um, several of his films are on Mubi. Um, Davida is is the kind of hero of that. Yeah, we'll definitely we'll um, be reviewing Davida and Nazar, which are both on Mubi, and uh, uh, possibly other ones. I can't I can't yet confirm. But yeah, okay. let's see what happens. Um, I think that's it. I think. We've kept it short and sweet. We've given you a little uh, bit of nectar from the the flower of MoobTube. Um, and now, <laughs> so sexual. <laughs> it's very sexual, isn't it? Uh, that's my repressed symbology there. Um, this is like the most avant-garde of uh, podcasts. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think Definitely. we can make it more avant-garde as well. Go on. I don't know. Are you <laughs> just watch watch the uh, stream that Ralph's recording um, with his pulsating purple background? Um, yeah, I've got one of those gay lights that changes with a bu- with the touch of a button. Um, okay. Thanks Dear for listening, followers. listeners. Follow us on the social channels. Follow us, touch us, love us. DM um, us. Slide in. To, to slide, slide right again. in. Slide <laughs> in like it's wet. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> tune in, <laughs> tune in, and watch various <laughs> films by Manny Cowell in time for our Manny Cowell special next week. Same time next week, plus one day. Lots of love. Bye. Thanks, Chicago. <laughs>